Welcome back to all of you here uh, in Berkeley, and welcome back to all of you uh, on the web. Thank you very much uh, again for your participation, and thank you very much for the questions that you're sending in. Um, our third formal presenter on the topic of health-based permissible exposure limit recommendation by the California Department of Public Health is Dr. Barbara Materna. Barbara is the chief of the occupational health branch in the California Department of Public Health. Prior to this position, she was chief of the occupational lead poisoning prevention program at the California Department of Public Health. Barbara is a certified industrial hygienist with over 30 years of occupational health uh, experience working for the most part in state and local government public health programs. She holds a PhD in environmental health sciences from UC Berkeley. Besides occupational lead poisoning prevention, Dr. Materna's work has focused on diverse topics including wildland firefighter exposures, injuries to among refuse collectors, lung disease linked to flavoring chemicals, and respiratory protection for the prevention of aerosol transmissible diseases. Please welcome Dr. Materna. Thank you very much, Dr. Howard. Hello, everyone. I'd like to thank Barbara Plogg and her staff at the CAOEH Continuing Education Program for hosting this symposium. Let's give them all a round of hand. I've been working on lead poisoning prevention for quite a long while now. Along with my colleagues, colleagues at the California Department of Public Health and many others, including many of you who are participating here today, either in the room with us or on webinars. I'm pleased to see the level of interest in this topic at this particular time. By continuing to work together, I know we can make progress toward better protection for lead-exposed workers. I'd like to start out today by reminding us of the context for holding this symposium at this particular time, and by using a metaphor. You see here on the right of the photo, the brand new San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge, which opened this September. Next to it is the old bridge, which was an architectural wonder in its day when it opened in 1936, but it's now being demolished. The original bridge, despite being constructed according to specific safety standards, failed in the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, hence the need for a new bridge meeting more modern seismic standards. So it is with lead standards. The 1978 Federal OSHA General Industry lead standard was groundbreaking in its time and it's resulted in inc increased protection for many, many workers, and really pretty much the disappearance of acute lead intoxication. The construction lead standard that was developed in the early 1990s extended this, these protections to construction workers, but without considering the new information on the toxicity of lead. So now in 2013, it's widely known that the lead standards are outdated and we look forward to moving down the road toward revi revising them. Here's the roadmap for my presentation today. I'll start out with a brief introduction of the Occupational Lead Poisoning Prevention Program and share some of our blood lead data on California workers. I'll remind you about some previous recommendations that we made to Cal OSHA for improvements in the lead standards. And finally, I'll explain the basis for CDPH's recommendation for a health-based permissible exposure limit. The Occupational Lead Poisoning Prevention Program was established in, in the California Department of Public Health through legislation that was passed in 1991. The legislation aimed to provide a comprehensive public health program to address the documented problem of occupational lead poisoning. In this program, we work cooperatively with employers, workers, and others to make these services available statewide. 
In the past 20 plus years, we've carried out a number of significant projects designed to help specific lead industries, for example, by offering training or on-site technical assistance. We have focused, for example, on radiator repair shops, as well as construction industries, including painting, remodeling, and heavy construction. Our legislative mandates include operating a statewide registry of adult blood lead test results. We also develop in and disseminate educational materials, conduct trainings, provide technical assistance, for example, to employers and healthcare providers. We investigate when a worker becomes lead poisoned or when family members have been exposed to lead brought home from the workplace. We work with these individual employers to ensure that unsafe working conditions are corrected. Finally, we're mandated to make recommendations to prevent occupational lead poisoning, and this includes how worker protection standards can be approved. So around the year 2000, we began to build the case for updating the lead standards. We have actively reviewed the scientific and technical literature on chronic and low level exposure and toxicity of lead. We worked with NIOSH, the National Center for Environmental Health, and the Association of Occupational and Environmental Clinics to convene a panel of lead experts to consider the current science and update medical management guidelines for lead exposed workers. This work res resulted in a 2007 publication in the journal Environmental Health Perspectives, which Dr. Kosnett had already mentioned. And it also served as the basis for the 2009 CDPH medical guidelines, which we distribute to healthcare providers. I'm going to share with you some current data from our blood lead registry, but first a little bit of introduction. By law, all blood lead test results in California must be reported to the California Department of Public Health. We process over 58,000 adult blood lead reports each year. Many of the reports are missing key information because either it was not submitted by the laboratory or the ordering or the doctor who ordered the test. So our staff invest a lot of time to obtain missing information but still, for about half of the workers tested each year, we're unable to determine the industry they work in. So this limits our ability to draw conclusions about blood lead distributions by industry. Finally, the most important thing to remember is that not all employers in lead industries offer blood lead testing to their workers. Clearly, this limits what we know about the magnitude and distributions of blood leads among California workers. So how bad is the lack of testing problem for workers potentially exposed to lead? Here on this slide, we provide the results from five studies that we conducted between 1996 and 2008. For each industry listed in the left-hand column, we used multiple available data sources to define the universe of employers in California in that specific industry. And then we determined which employers were conducting blood lead testing. The resulting column on the right, the percentage of companies testing is listed here, ordered from highest to lowest. So as you can see, in some industries, such as battery manufacture, blood lead testing is the norm. This is clearly not the case across all industries. This year, we re-examined the proportion of employers conducting blood lead testing in these industries by using a different approach. The column on the right calculates the percentage of employers testing by comparing the number of employers with results reported to the registry versus the number of California establishments in that industry based on US Census data for 2011. The results are still in the same ballpark compared to our previous studies with the percentage of employers testing ranging from 2% up to nearly 90%. So the consequence of this problem is that for some industries, we have a much better idea 
of the true blood lead distributions than in others. Here I've highlighted three industries where only a small portion of employers perform blood lead testing. For these industries, we don't know the true distribution of workers' blood leads across the industry, just the findings for a small number of employers who do provide blood lead testing. This slide shows the blood lead distribution of California workers tested during 2012. The left-hand column shows different blood lead ranges from the lowest category of one to four micrograms per deciliter onto the top category of 50 plus. The middle column shows that over 18,000 workers were tested in 2012. For the right-hand column, we put each worker in the blood lead category that represents their highest blood lead for the year if they were tested more than once, and then calculated the percentage of workers in each blood lead category. So you can see that 82% of the workers tested had blood leads in the one to four microgram per deciliter range. However, when you look at the higher blood lead ranges, you see that there are over 3,000 California workers documented with blood leads at or above five micrograms per deciliter, and nearly 1,500 at or above 10. These are levels at which workers may suffer long-term health consequences if their exposures persist over time. In comparison, and I think Dr. Kosnett mentioned that uh, the geometric mean blood lead level in the general adult population is currently 1.2 micrograms per deciliter. And again, it's important to remember that all not, not all lead-exposed workers in California are represented in these data due to the lack of testing. This slide shows the 10 industries that tested the largest number of workers in 2012. The highlighted column in the middle shows the number of workers tested in each industry, ordered with the industry testing the most, on top. So you see that remediation services companies tested the most workers, around 1,200, followed by battery manufacturers. The right-hand column shows the number of companies providing testing in each industry. So I'll give you a moment to just scan through and check out these top 10 industries. And then here again, I'll point out the problem with lack of testing with an example. In the painting industry, note that 60 employers tested a total of 549 workers in 2012. For comparison, according to the US Census data, there are over 22,000 employers in this industry in California, and 38, uh, excuse me, 22,000 employees in this industry in California, and 3,800 employers. We understand that not every single worker in this industry is potentially exposed to lead. However, it's clear that this industry and others are not adequately represented in our blood lead registry. Looking at this same table, if you focus on the highlighted column on the left, you can see the percentage of workers with elevated blood leads defined as 10 micrograms per deciliter and higher for each industry. Based on these data, there are some industries where we find a much lower percentage of workers with elevated blood leads than in other industries. So I'll give you a moment to scan through that column. They really range. A low percentage of elevated blood leads may be due to a number of different reasons. For example, the industry might have low airborne exposures, and so exposure control is easier. Or the industry may have significant airborne exposures, and employers do a great job of controlling exposure. Or blood lead testing is not widespread in the industry, and we're only seeing the results for those employers who both provide blood lead tests and are effectively protecting their workers.
This is a new slide. This slide shows the top 10 industries where the highest percentage of workers had elevated blood leads, again defined as 10 micrograms per deciliter and higher. And here in this slide, we chose to include only the more significant industries in terms of uh, the amount of blood lead testing, those that tested 30 employees during the year or more. So this table is sorted by the percentage of workers with elevated blood leads, uh, ranging from 80% for firing ranges at the top, down on down to 17% for plumbing, heating, and air, con air conditioning contractors. If you're curious about blood lead distributions in other industries, uh, we have data on blood lead distributions for all industries in a report that's on our website and represents the years 2008 to 2011. So what are our conclusions about blood lead testing? First and foremost, employer testing is the best way for our program to identify high-risk industries for our targeted prevention work. However, we only have a partial picture of both the magnitude and distribution of blood leads in California due to lack of testing among light exposed workers and missing information on laboratory reports. Finally, even without having a complete picture, we're able to see that some industries and some individual employers do keep their, blood leads, their employees' blood leads low, while others may need assistance or increased motivation to reduce their exposures. In June 2010, CDPH provided recommendations to CalOSHA for improving the lead standards. We proposed revisions for many aspects of the standards, but our four core recommendations are listed here. First, the medical removal protection level, again, as, as was mentioned by Dr. Kosnett earlier, uh, that is the blood lead that causes workers to be temporarily removed from their jobs due to excessive exposures, needs to be lowered. Secondly, we recommended increasing the required frequency of blood lead testing. This will help employers assess if workplace controls are adequately protecting against both inhalation and ingestion exposure. We also recommended eliminating routine zinc prot protoporphyrin testing um, because it is not helpful at lower blood leads. We would also like to see blood lead testing required in all lead workplaces, independent of the air monitoring results. This would help to identify situations with significant ingestion exposure, even where air lead levels are low. And it could also cause more employers to test, even if they don't do air monitoring. Finally, we stated that the permissible exposure limit for lead needed to be lowered, but our specific recommendation was pending completion of the OEHA modeling work. The health effects literature summarized earlier today by Dr. Kosnett, along with the result of OEHA's modeling of the air lead blood lead relationship, provide the scientific basis for the CDPH health-based permissible exposure limit recommendation. I'll present it briefly here and then use the rest of my presentation to further explain how we arrived at this recommendation. We have concluded that blood leads in the range of five to 10 micrograms per deciliter and higher pose a health risk to workers if they continue over a working lifetime. This concern is strongly supported by the science, including the 2007 Environmental Health Perspectives monograph on lead and two reports issued by the National Toxicology Program and US EPA in 2012 and 2013. To prevent blood leads in the five to 10 micrograms per deciliter range, we have determined that air lead concentrations must, must not exceed an eight hour time weighted average of 0 0.5 to 2.1 micrograms per cubic meter. I'll explain in a moment a little bit more about why we provided a range rather than a single number for a recommended PEL. <coughs> At a PEL of 0 0.5 micrograms per cubic meter, 95% of the workers would maintain their blood leads less than five. 
at a PEL of 2.1 micrograms per cubic meter, 95% of the workers would stay under 10. And because of the distribution of workers, 57% would stay under 5. We recognize that Cal OSHA must consider both technological and ec economic feasibility in their development of a PEL. Our recommendation for a health-based PEL is based on the best available science, and the future rulemaking process will consider these other aspects. Let's go back for a minute and consider how federal OSHA developed its PEL in for lead in 1978. FedOSHA used a pharmacokinetic model that was available in the 1970s. However, since then, newer models have been developed based on the information on the pharmacokinetics of lead, and also new approaches have been developed for modeling particle deposition in the respiratory tract. The record for the PEL development for the FedOSHA standard concluded that PEL development must consider how to prevent early and subclinical effects, how to protect workers over a working lifetime, and how to protect susceptible individuals. And by susceptible, we mean individuals who are more like to, likely to be harmed by lead exposure, for example, due to a pre-existing medical condition such as hypertension. When reviewing the extensive scientific literature on lead and its chronic low-level health effects, there's widespread agreement that there is no known threshold below which there is no risk of adverse health effects. And as more research is conducted, especially as it becomes possible to study people who lived in an era where body burdens of lead are lower than in the past, that research continues to show effects at lower and lower exposure levels. So it's important to remember that the recommendations that we make today may also become outdated. Still, it's important to act on the information that we have now. I'm going to go through briefly the, th the key definitive findings from the three main sources used by CDPH in drawing our conclusions about the health effects of chronic low-level lead exposure. I'll just touch on them very briefly. You've heard about a lot of the studies uh, rather than duplicate um, any of what was already presented. So the authors of the 2007 Environmental Health Perspectives article concluded that blood leads that persist at levels as low as 10 micrograms per deciliter and higher increase the risk of hypertension, kidney dysfunction, and reduced birth weight. The second source considered by CDPH was the National Toxicology Program's monograph, Health Effects of Low-Level Lead, that was released in 2012. In this work, NTP was looking for evidence of effects in populations with blood lead ranges as low as under 10 and under 5 micrograms per deciliter. NTP did acknowledge that these groups that were studied likely had higher blood leads earlier in their lives. This report concluded that there was sufficient evidence of an association between lead and increased blood pressure and risk of hypertension based on epidemiological studies of humans with blood leads less than 10. In addition for blood leads under 10, NTP found a significant association for increased risk of essential tumor, which uh, tremor, sorry, um, which is a, a neurological effect. In addition, based on studies of people that had blood leads less than five, NTP found sufficient evidence of a decreased kidney filtration rate and reduced fetal growth. The third source considered by CDPH uh, was US EPA's 2013 report on lead health effects. This effort examined the scientific evidence for effects at levels experienced by the general population due to lead pollutant exposure. 
but EPA did not link their conclu conclusions to specific blood lead level ranges. US EPA determined that there is a causal relationship between low level lead exposure and hypertension, coronary heart disease, and male reproductive effects. EPA determined that there was a likely causal relationship with decreased cognitive function and psychopathological effects. We know that the health effects found in adults studied today <clears throat> may have been influenced by higher blood leads that they experienced earlier in life. So this limits us from drawing definitive conclusions about the risk of health effects in adults with, whose blood leads have never exceeded 10 micrograms per deciliter. However, the strongest evidence exists and allows us to say with confidence that low-level lead exposure increases blood pressure and hypertension and, and the risk of hypertension and also other cardiovascular effects. There are multiple, as you've heard this morning, multiple high-quality studies that show these effects in adults with chronic blood leads as low as 10 micrograms per deciliter and higher. In addition, we're concerned about the neurological effects at these levels, such as decreased cognitive function later in life. The epidemiological findings are strong, and they're supported by toxicological data. The tox findings demonstrate the similar effects in animals, and they identify plausible mechanisms of action for these effects. So we have concluded that a revised permissible exposure limit that keeps blood leads under 10 over a working lifetime will greatly decrease the risk of adverse cardiovascular and neurological effects in workers. However, since these effects appear in populations with blood leads as low as 10 and higher, this would not provide a margin of safety for the more susceptible workers. Therefore, we point out that a more protective, a more health protective PEL would keep blood leads under five micrograms per deciliter. And so we've provided a recommendation for a PEL at this other end of the range for it to meet both targeted blood lead goals. The sources of health data I cited earlier evaluated lead's health effects on male reproduction and identified concerns including effects on semen and sperm quality, fertility, and time to pregnancy. However, the male reproductive effects have been observed at slightly higher blood lead level ranges compared to other health endpoints. Therefore, keeping workers' blood leads under five to five or 10 micrograms per deciliter should be expected to provide protection for male reproductive health. Among female workers, we're concerned about the risk of decreased fetal growth noted by NTP at blood leads under five. In addition, we know that blood leads under five in children have been associated with multiple nervous system effects. And so this evidence justifies keeping women's blood leads well under five micrograms per deciliter during pregnancy. Therefore, our recommended PEL range is not sufficient to protect pregnant workers. However, the existing medical removal provisions of the standards can be used to provide for temporary protection that a pregnant woman or a woman planning a pregnancy would need. We recommend that, th that new language be added to the standard to explicitly state that MRP benefits would apply in such cases. So for a quick recap, the principal task that CDPH requested of OEHA was to estimate the workplace air lead concentration that we re would result in blood leads of 5, 10, 15, 20, and 30 micrograms per deciliter if inhaled by workers over a 40-year working lifetime. Our goal was to use these results to our, inform our recommendation for a health-based PEL. So this table, which Dr. Vork presented earlier, shows the estimates that were produced by OEHA. It's excerpted from the full table uh, in the OEHA report, which goes up to even higher blood lead levels. 
On the left is the eight-hour time-weighted average workplace air lead level that would produce the corresponding blood lead shown at the right for the 95th percentile worker after 40 years of a worker working lifetime. At the 95th percentile, 95% of workers' blood leads would be expected to be less than the blood lead shown in the right-hand column. Our health-based PEL recommendation for an eight-hour time-weighted average air lead level is provided as a range, shown here with a highlighting. Uh, a PEL of 2.1 micrograms per cubic meter, which would keep 95% of workers' blood leads under 10, or a more protective PEL of 0.5 micrograms per cubic meter, which would keep 95% of workers' blood leads under 5 and provide somewhat of a margin of safety, since there is conclusive evidence of health effects with chronic blood leads starting at 10 and higher. I'd like to discuss this figure, which is also from the OEHA report. This shows graphically the modeled rise in blood lead level of the 95th percentile worker who gradually, who gradually reaches a blood lead limit of 5, 10, 15, 20, or 30, and so on, um, over the 40-year working lifetime. The x-axis shows exposure time in years. The y-axis shows the blood lead level of the 95th percentile worker. Um, and five different exposure scenarios are shown. Um, if you start by focusing on the bottom, I don't know where, on the bottom corner, down here, um, you can see how the, ex the exposure scenario goes. For the first two years, the worker only receives background lead exposure. Then at year two, exposure to the airborne lead levels uh, starts, and this bottom line, the blue line, shows an air lead level of 0.5 micrograms per cubic meter. These numbers are taken from the table you saw a minute ago. So the blood lead increases, hits a, a, a blood lead of 5, the limit blood le level at that air lead level, and so on. 2.1, here's the exposure, and the blood lead goes up and continues. Notice that the blood leads climb rapidly during the first year of ongoing workplace exposure, then somewhat slower during the next couple of years, and then much, at a much slower rate uh, for the remaining exposure time. So, and while the blood lead might not be increasing substantially during these subsequent years, there will be a significant increase in bone lead that's occurring. And then this lead in the bone can continuously be released back out into the blood over the worker's lifetime. So my point here is that a worker may be at risk of chronic health effects from lead without having 40 years of exposure, continuous exposure at the air lead level that we recommend for a PEL. For example, a worker who quickly reached a blood lead of 10 or 15 and then works five to 10 more years still has quite a significant chronic exposure at the, those levels that we would be concerned about. So to conclude, the lead standards, now over 30 years old, are based on outdated information on lead toxicity. The medical removal protection levels, other key provisions, and the PEL must be revised in order to adequately protect lead-exposed workers. The CDPH health-based PEL recommendation is based on the current health effects literature on lead and on OEHA's modeling of the air lead blood lead relationship. Our recommendation is for an eight hour time weighted average of 0.5 to 2.1 micrograms per cubic meter, which would provide protection for the 95th percentile worker from blood leads greater than five or 10 respectively. This slide shows the key references um, that I've referred to. They're all available on our website. I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge the exceptional, exceptional staff of the Occupational Lead Poisoning Prevention Program who contributed to the work shown in this presentation that I get to do up here. 
Uh, and to close, I look forward to our discussion period this afternoon and to continuing to work with Kalosha and all other interested stakeholders as we move on down the road towards revising the lead standards. Thank you very much.